Okay, so having got a bit more knowledge about our forks, what about the, uh, the can in the middle, the shock um, that so many of us read a bit of blurb about, believe a bit of hype about, listen to a mate who's just spent a lot of money on one and take their advice without any understanding. Come a long way in, in, in a short space of time relatively. Um, yeah. And I know there's a lot of distance, different systems out there. Yeah. Can you talk us through the three, two or three basic types of shock that we're looking at now in today's bikes and the benefits that we can expect to get yeah. from that extra technology and at what point we think perhaps we should be looking at upgrading? For sure. Um, so real, real simply, I mean, the shock, we set up slightly different from the fork, so we'll use techniques with kind of sag and stuff like that with, with actual regard to setup. But what you're kind of talking about is how far do you want to go with your riding and how much you can adjust it on the fly on the trail. So the kind of type of shock that you have here with the, the PPS and Fox, um, basic kind of um, ad adjustment to a point or, or nice on the fly adjustment. So we again have rebound damping, which you can make the, the shock uh, slower or faster, trail setting or um, a kind of open setting even, sorry, uh, that will make the, the kind of, when you're in the open position, either um, again, firmer or softer, and then an on the fly three position platform lever, which I'm sure you use when you're climbing up, up hills or fire roads or stuff like that, or not, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stick it in the middle man and, and leave it there really. Okay, um, yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine. And to be honest, you're speaking to another gent the same, so. Um, problem is with uh, pedal platforms and stuff like that is that I've been caught out a few times gone barreling into the next section of trail totally forgetting that I've got all the platforms on mm -hmm. and finding that suddenly it's not quite as much fun as it should have been. So, so we've got, a, we've got a, a setting for going uphill effectively or pedaling yeah. hard, we've got a settling yeah. for trail and we've got a setting for descend yeah. um, and that basically opens up the shock makes it work more, is yeah. that what we're saying? Essentially what we're talking about is um, this kind of low speed uh, compression damping so we talked about uh, rebound damping and we're talking now about compression damping so again it has rebound damping so it controls how quickly the shock will extend um, but, but we're talking about how quickly it compresses how quickly it compresses yeah so exactly. the bumpier the trail the bumpier the trail if you have it on open the easier the wheel will move if you then kind of close it close the um, platform setting right down um, it will give you a, a kind of nice firmer uh, pedal platform essentially to, to, to push against or um, I mean people use them for kind of if you've got like, maybe a flow trail that you don't want the thing to kind of move quite as much when you want a little bit more kind of push against it you might use a trail setting for that like your, your middle setting to kind of get the bike to stand up a bit more. So if I adjust my compression um, it's basically going to deal with the terrain differently. Yeah exactly um, and that's on the fly adjustment so you've basically well, another one from a different manufacturer here but essentially you've got uh, rebound damping in, in the front and then the, your compression which is uh, again three possession uh, three position platforms so either open uh, trail or pedal and then lock or close which is kind of as firm as it will get um, and, and again then your air pressure that you can adjust on the fly so the air pressure is again something I'd set up for my weight yep and but, again. but the, <coughs> the, the the compression damping is something I would set up for the terrain not me yeah um, and so then much. and then to put another angle on that the bicycle manufacturer will have uh, decided where to fundamentally set the levels of compression that you're adjusting on the fly. Right, so, okay. um, so it's working within a within a range that's preset, preset by the manufacturer. By the manufacturer yeah. So I can't expect on something like this a massive range of adjustment? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it, it, you'll see um, on, on kind of shocks different tunes, as it were, so they're different settings inside that a manufacturer has gone, okay, this bike uses a VPP or um, That's a virtual pivot point. Yep, uh, or single pivot possibly, more like your orange or a four bar, like a specialized or something like that, or uh, ABP, like your Trek. These kind of linkages, bicycle manufacturer would have figured out a compression and rebound tune best suited to the way that that frame moves and the leverage ratio of the rear wheel to shock. So there's quite a lot of stuff going on inside there that people put a lot of thought into. Indeed, um, and from from my background in, in terms of skills coaching, one of the things I'm looking at is also setting the rider up in the right place on the bike so that the suspension works as it's yeah. designed. Exactly. So if I'm balanced on top of the bike, up on my toes and leaning forward, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that the designer of that suspension system no. wasn't expecting me to be riding like that. So whatever I do, I'm not gonna get much out of my yeah. shock. But then people ride bikes differently, people will, have it again comes down to this thing where um, different different customers different riders will ride differently depending on whether you're super aggressive using things that, uh, for kind of more jump lines or, or maybe you're one of these riders that likes to bounce from point to point as opposed to 
kind of take a, a kind of nice straight line and expect the bike to do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. If you like your bike set up real loose and kind of bouncy and playful and fun and you're having all that kind of stuff on it, you're going to have your bike set up differently to someone who is after just out and out speed or um, your magic carpet flushness. So. so we've set up our air um, in terms of that compression uh, damping. Uh, we've also got rebound on there. Yep. Um, same as the front, same exactly. as the front on the fork. Yep. Speed at which it bounces back at us. Yep. Um, so I'm guessing if we're over lots of small bumps, a rooty section yep. or a real rooty section, we want quite a high rate. Um, yeah, to a point. I mean, you kind of, it's, it's always a gain of balance. <laughs> so uh, in a trail, you aren't necessarily going to be hit with just one feature. There's not a trail, or well, there might be a trail where you literally are just repeatedly hitting roots. Yeah. But you kind of want to set the, the shock up. Um, quick enough that it'll extend, but not so quick that if you kind of hit something a little bit larger feature in the trail that you, you will get bucked over the bars or um, actually kind of too fast, you can go the other way. And, and although the, the wheel is kind of you know moving nicely, you're not gaining any grip because it's not tracking the floor. It's just bouncing, so it's just bouncing off. Of it, so. Similar to having a tire pressure way too high. Exactly, yeah. And again, I guess similar to the tire pressure being too low, yeah. there's a problem with that as well exactly. in terms of wallowing yeah. um, and wallowing out. So again, are we looking for the similar sort of rate of usage in terms of if I've got a magic band on there to tell yeah. me how I'm using? So I mean, uh, again, it's good to, to use SAG at this point because um, the manufacturers designed the bike around a, a kind of dynamic position. So the the bike will be sat with your body mass on it, displacing the spring at a certain ride height, and that's kind of where you want to aim. And that's for. where they've aimed it to be. Yeah. Um, but again, depending on how aggressive you are, you can kind of either at that 30%, 25% sag run through the travel a lot more quickly. Um, so that's where, again, we come into um, a volume reduction. So we use bands or tokens or something in there to basically reduce the volume down and give you more or less progression in the air spring. So it's giving you another fundamental kind of tool to use, okay. um, but still maintaining the bike's dynamic as the way it is supposed to ride. So, so this has got uh, both those two facilities to uh, yep. play around with, to experiment yep. with, and and you know, as like a lot of riders, I probably don't do it enough. So um, I'm probably going to go away and have a little play with that myself. Um, then we get to slightly more advanced systems and mm -hmm. setups. Um, We've got kind of some some with a, a little piggyback yep. um, on there, a little a, a little mini shock on there. What is going on there? Uh, so that is just packaging of the uh, of the shock in a slightly different way. Um, so what we're talking about here is a, is a kind of inline shock. Um, so basically everything, the air cans around the outside of it, the damping um, and the uh, the nitrogen charge is all housed in in the kind of one plane, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and then the main damping piston is controlled in this barrel or, or the body of the shock. So that's um, an all-in-one? It's an all-in-one, it's got the shims, it's got the oil, it's got everything all kind of housed in one. This one here... What are they stripped out and put in here? Well, that is essentially the nitrogen charge. This is, uh, to throw another ball in, this is a twin tube damper. So actually the oil flow is controlled slightly differently to this or a, or a conventional piggyback shock. So um, rather than this just displacing oil into the into the... Uh, piggyback in a kind of wet manner like this. It's actually got two oil paths um, and the main reason they've done that is to allow you to have further adjustability over the rebound and compression. So this damper has four-way adjustment. So it's got compression, high and low speed, rebound, high and low speed, uh, plus a pedal platform and then obviously your air chamber which you can reduce the volume of. So suddenly you've, you've got, got a, lot a more whole going world on. of adjustments to play with which is kind of it's great, now, realistically, great <laughs> that sounds ideal if I knew uh, how to use it all. Yeah, um, that is. How quickly, if I'm a Luddite and I'm not particularly uh, technically minded, how quickly do you think I can get my head around all of this? And is the money I invest in a new shock like this perhaps better spent on more regularly servicing something like this? What point would you think, do you know what? It's time to get an upgraded shock. Yeah. So um, things like this you can tune internally. So if you wanted to change the characteristic of your... Monarch, your DPS, you send to someone like ourselves, we'll speak to you as a customer to decide how you want that, pair it up with the linkage of the bike, um, just because you know for, uh, Santa Cruz or Mondrake or whoever it is has come up with a kind of tune, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to suit with you, so mm -hmm. we will basically kind of take all that information into account and, and retune it for you. The great thing about this is that it then is in your court, so you can then do all the fine adjustments. So are you the type of rider that wants to play around with adjusting the shock between settings and, and between uh -huh. places you ride, or are you the type of rider that just wants to have it there with a few, uh, a few basic features just to kind of 
generally have it work when you're riding the shock. So what we're saying to a degree is that I can make some adjustments with this, yep. but a lot of the bigger adjustments I want to make have it's to go internal. off to someone like exactly, you. Yeah. Whereas something like this, I've got more to play with externally. and adjust yeah. externally. Um, so a lot more adjustment, yep. a lot infinitely tunable without sending it away. Yep. And I guess the advantage there is if I don't like it, I don't have to send it back to change it back again. Yeah, you can just and I can it. just change it away. Yep. Um, I can see lurking in your pocket um, something a little bit more lively. <laughs> now, coil, yep. um, typically found on very, very cheap 79 pounds Halfords, uh, not necessarily that brand, <laughs> typically found on very, very cheap um, bikes that look like suspension yep. bikes, or at the other end of the scale yep. on very, very, very highly tuned bikes, exactly. and perhaps more typically on more aggressive uh, riding terrain, yep. bigger, bigger features. <laughs> What's the main advantage of a coil? Uh, it, and yeah. is it something that Joe Public needs to be thinking about at this stage? And where am I going to get, what benefits am I going to get from this bad boy? Okay, um, so. And does it fit my bike? <laughs> yeah. <Can> do one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with, with the air, like we said, it's infinitely adjustable. You can change the progression, change the spring rate just by pumping up with a shock pump. Simple, great. You've got this one, loads of external adjustment as well to add to it, but essentially you can still adjust it yourself. Um, coil. A lot more responsive. There's no stiction from the air seals. Um, stiction, that's kind of um, so the, the kind of breakaway force, the, uh -huh. the initial kind of breakaway friction of it. There's no kind of friction because there is no air seal around the outside of it. You've purely got the damping seals and that's it. Um, it's a bit heavier, but its progression is totally linear. So you're talking about uh, just the damper controlling it and then the spring rate, um, it, it goes through its travel in a, in a very linear manner. So, you so it's gonna feel plusher? Yeah, plusher. More um, constant? More constant. With pressure. the coil, it has a certain level of pressure which it will force out in the opposite direction per um, inch that it's compressed, and that is m um, continuous the whole way through its travel. So it is a straight line of compression as opposed to a curve. So it's a more more, more uh, consistent feel to your ride? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, my Apollo Shockwave didn't have this little added extra bit on. <laughs> yeah. um, what's that all about? That is where the magic happens. <laughs> Excellent. We love no. a bit of magic. Oh, yes. um, um, can you explain that in um, Luddite layman terms to me? So this uh, particular shock is off an evil reckoning. Um, so it won't fit your bike. Um, not purely down to just the size of the shock, physically eye to eye and stroke, which That's is- what Eye to eye is here. Yep. And stroke length is the amount it The moves, amount of which it? it compresses, yep. Okay. Um, so and they're matched to an individual bike. Yeah, so I mean, there's pretty standard sizes which are now kind of going metric, um, but the, the kind of standard sizes uh, for Bronson, 257 from memory, uh, Evil Reckoning, uh, 215 by 63, or eight and a half, two and a half, if we're talking Imperial. The, uh, the actual kind of shock itself is, is internally bespoke tuned for you, your bike, and, and how the kind of the thing will work through that. So uh -huh. for each um, for each 11.6 is built, it is bespoke built with your rider weight in mind, how you're using the bike, the linkage. So of the, the whole bike. shock is built around my yeah. riding style and my weight and, yeah. and things like that. So it is internally set up for you. Wow. Um, and then I'm on the outside, you then still have the adjustment for kind of trail setting and uh, like it's uh, the double overhead double overhead cam will give you two compression settings which are totally independent of each other um, and you can have one for climbing and one for downhill you can have one for flow trails you can have one for downhill you can have two very close to each other depending on whether you're going downhill over rocks and roots and stuff or whether it's a little bit more kind of smooth and kind of you want to press off things a little bit more so it so this is kind of the creme de la creme would you say this this does, does not particularly this brand but this design with coil and yep. uh it's is or is this unique th that particular shock is pretty unique um or it is very unique but the coil shock as a whole used to be limited to downhill applications so people because of weight would, just because of weight yeah and, and the way things are the way things kind of go you say you either get it on your very cheap bikes just because it's a physical spring um or kind of downhill rigs whereas with the trail bikes becoming more and more aggressive and more capable, coil shocks kind of will fit very nicely into that, into that application, especially ones that can give you a form of pedal platform, like either with your climb switch or your, your overhead valves or... So this has got a little bit more adjustment than we might get on a standard coil. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that extra detail on what's what. Um, 
certainly opened my eyes up to a lot of the different options mm -hmm. and, and at least a fundamental basic understanding from which to build. Um, this, these videos aren't necessarily about you going away knowing your shop, but look knowing what to look for. Um, and that's where we'll go in the next video, is just a few little uh, tips on setup, adjustment, and just when to appreciate and how to appreciate when you need to make that adjustment. And perhaps when it's not the shop setup that's wrong, but actually time to get something a bit more, uh, send it away for something more work to be done. Mm -hmm.